Okay, so for number 19, it asks us to pick out which is most likely to act as a Lewis base. So I've gone ahead and written here that to be a Lewis base, you have to have a lone pair. Okay, that's our, that's our sole definition for a Lewis base, something that can donate a lone pair. So they gave us Lewis structures here, but they didn't draw on any lone pairs that might be there. And so we know this molecule, if we were to redraw the hydrogens, so pretend those aren't there, if we were to draw them in, this would be the full structure on that side, and then we would have hydrogen at each point here so that the carbons that aren't explicitly drawn each have four bonds. Okay, we can see no lone pairs. Okay, one of my favorite expressions in referring to B is don't be a moron, remember boron. Boron only needs six electrons. So this is actually the final Lewis structure. No lone pairs, so that one's out come over here and we look at this nitrogen containing compound and we'd see that if we, we get rid of those hydrogens and draw them in explicitly hydrogen, hydrogen our nitrogen as drawn only has six electrons around it we know it needs to have a full octet and so go ahead and put a lone pair on that Okay, so this seems like it's promising. It could be a Lewis base as a lone pair. I'm not going to go through and draw the hydrogens on D, but we have all carbon hydrogen bonds, and those don't have any lone pairs associated with them, so that's out. And this iron 3 plus isn't going to be a Lewis base, right? This is going to be our Lewis acid. So that's not it. So our Lewis base is just option C because there's a lone pair in that structure. Okay. For problem number 20, they give us a reaction that's at equilibrium. So just like my good old habit, I wrote the KEQ expression. And then they plot KEQ as a function of temperature. So when we look at this plot, we can see KEQ getting smaller, 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 smaller as we heat up the temperature. Okay, so just looking at this plot, what I'm seeing is that as we increase temperature, we shift to reactants. Because K is getting smaller which means our denominator is getting bigger. We have more reactants around. Okay. So let's look at the options. A says as temperature increases, production of H2 increases. And so we decided that that must be false because increasing temperature is shifting toward reactants and H2 is a product, so no. B says, as KEQ decreases, the amount of CO2 at equilibrium increases. So smaller K means more reactants, and CO2 is a product, so this doesn't make sense. C says, to maximize production of H, or maximum production of H2 occurs at 1500 Kelvin, where KEQ is less than 1. So we don't even really have to look at the plot for this one, because we know if KEQ is less than 1, that that would be reactants favored. And H2 is a product, so it's not going to be favoring H2. So that, not right. 
Okay, D says, to maximize production of H2, the reaction must be run at a low temperature where KEQ is greater than 1. And this makes sense. This one checks out. Okay, because when KEQ is big, we'll have more products around. H2 is a product, so this one seems promising. Let's go ahead and look at E. Maximum production of H2 occurs at 1100 where K equals 1. And this is false because this is where we're going to have the products equal to the amount of reactants. And that's by no means maximizing. Okay, so the answer there is just E. And so if we're heating this up and shifting toward reactants, that must mean that this is an exothermic process where heat is serving like a product. So as we add more and more of it, we end up shifting to the left. Here in, number prob in problem number 21, we have a combustion and that's evident because we have a hydrocarbon reacting with oxygen to make CO2 and water. So you definitely want to be able to identify combustion reactions. And they give us the delta H. It's negative, which makes sense for combustion. And they also give us the value for the entropy. Okay, and they say we're going to use this to heat our house and brush up. And they want us to figure out how much work can be done at a given temperature. And so when they ask to figure out how much work is produced, they're just asking for a delta G. Okay. And they give us a temperature, but don't forget, in Chem 112, we never use Celsius. We're always using Kelvin. So I just went ahead and immediately rewrote that. And so when we combine delta H and delta S, we're going to use this reaction here, or this equation here. It's on the data sheet. It's one of the most important equations from Chem 112. And so they gave us our delta H as negative 393 kilojoules per mole. And they gave us our delta S as 101 joules per kel mole kelvin. But hopefully you guys can see that our units don't match between those two. We have one in kilojoules and one in joules and they need to be the same. So I'm actually going to use a delta S of 0 0.101 kilojoules per mole kelvin. Okay, don't let those units get you. And then our temperature, which I marked in Kelvin, is 223. Oops. Kelvin. So now we'll just take those data and put them into this equation and solve for delta G. So we'll have delta G is going to be equal to negative 393 kilojoules minus 223 Kelvin times 0 0.101 kilojoules per Kelvin. And when you evaluate this, you get that it is negative 415.5 kilojoules of work that can be done by this heater. And that, that would correspond to answer choice E. Okay, and the reason that answer choice E is positive when we solve for it to be negative is when they say it's being done by the heater, they're already, in that wording, they're implying the negative sign. 
if they said being done to the heater, then that would be a positive delta G. Okay. In number 22, we have some bonds, and they want us to figure out which ones are the most highly polarized and we'll dissociate. Okay, so let's start with our first molecule here, molecule A. And so, highly polarized bonds are going to have a big difference in electronegativity. So let's remember our trend for electronegativity. If we have the periodic table, electronegativity increases up and to the right to fluorine. So fluorine's the most electronegative atom. But what we want to look for here is a big difference in electronegativity. So if we look at the oxygen chlorine bonds, Oxygen and chlorine independently are very electronegative, but the difference between them isn't that great. But the difference in electronegativity between oxygen and hydrogen is very big. That's sort of what makes hydrogen bonding such a, a big thing, is because those bonds are so extremely polar. And so it is indeed this bond that's most polar, bond C, and that's what would dissociate or break apart. And this can also make sense if we look at the formula for this HCl04. We know is a strong acid. And so it makes sense that the bond that would release the hydrogen would be the most polarized. Excuse me. So now we have this calcium containing molecule and we can see that we have two flavors of bonds to count for. We have hydrogen oxygen bond which as I just mentioned is very polar but then we also have a calcium oxygen bond and so here what we have is a metal and a non-metal and the differences in electronegativity are always greatest between a metal and a non-metal. Okay. That's why ionic bonds are a thing. And so this bond E is going to be the most polarized of these two. And we would lose hydroxide in this structure. And this makes sense if we think about the formula again, which is calcium hydroxide which is a strong base, so it makes sense that it would you know, release the OH groups too. Okay, so C and E are the most polarized bonds.